We appreciate your interest and attention. Let's begin our presentation, Testosterone, the Heart Hormone for Men, with a case study. This is a 64-year-old physician with a four-year history of symptomatic coronary artery disease. He was experiencing classic substernal chest pressure with left arm radiation, walking one flight of stairs or three blocks. This chest discomfort would resolve with rest or two to four nitroglycerin tablets. He undergoes a baseline stress EKG study. This was the master's two-step. You walk up and down a two-step step ladder. We record how many trips up and down the step ladder you can tolerate and how long your chest discomfort lasts. So we do the baseline stress EKG study. Then our patient receives 25 milligrams of intramuscular testosterone every seven to 10 days. And we repeat the stress EKG periodically to monitor his progress and assess the effects of testosterone therapy. Now, after three injections here in the arrows, his chest discomfort had improved, he was back to work. Following eight injections, there was a definite objective improvement. The number of trips up and down the two-step step ladder before he experienced chest pain had increased from 40 to 72. Chest pain duration decreased from 90 to 23 seconds. 34 months after his 12th injection, he was experiencing minimal angina. But then he died. Well, let's try with another case study. 57-year-old grocery store clerk with a six-month history of chest discomfort. He was experiencing classic substernal chest discomfort with one flight of stairs or three blocks on a level surface. The chest discomfort responded to rest or nitroglycerin tablets. He also had a, a baseline master two-step EKG. He was treated with intramuscular testosterone, 25 milligrams every seven to 10 days with periodic stress EKGs to monitor progress. And he also improved. With three intramuscular injections, he experienced a subjective improvement. Objective improvement began with six treatments. Trips to pain doubled, 35 to 70, and the duration of chest pain was lessened. Following 12 treatments, he was able to return to work. He stopped therapy with 16 injections. Two years following termination of testosterone therapy, chest discomfort recurred. He was treated again with 25 milligrams intramuscularly every week for six weeks. His chest pain resolved. 12 months later, he's angina free. But then he died. Both of our patients responded to testosterone therapy, and then they died. Now, this is of, of concern to us. We have many therapies in cardiovascular medicine that make you feel better, but may have an adverse effect on long-term outcome. We need to make sure that testosterone does not have an adverse effect on long-term outcome, but it really didn't. These two patients died, as did the other 98 patients participating in this study, as did the research associates and the physicians involved, because this study was carried out by Dr. Maurice Lesser in 1946. This is the first study of the therapeutic effects of testosterone that I could find. Dr. Lesser treated 100 consecutive patients with testosterone, 92 men and eight women. They received 25 milligrams of intramuscular testosterone twice a week for two weeks and once a week to follow, and he monitored them for level of improvement. Of the eight women, 25% had a marked improvement, angina-free two months following the last injection. 50% had a moderate improvement, angina frequency decreased by 50%. 25% did not respond to therapy, their angina did not improve. Of the men, 53% had a marked improvement, 39% had a moderate improvement. So of the men, 92% responded favorably to testosterone therapy. Now the benefits were slow in developing and it, it takes some time for testosterone to work and there's some individual variation. One third, no, one third noted no improvement over the first month. The average number of injections required was 12. Some needed 20 to 25. Subjective benefits at 28 days, objective at 43 days. The benefits lasted two to 34 months. Now, of course, whenever we carry out a therapy, we want to make sure the benefits are due to the therapy and not due to a placebo effect, a benefit because you expect to get better. So five of his patients received sesame oil injections over six weeks. They didn't know they were getting sesame oil and not testosterone. Their angina was not affected. Their angina did improve after they were switched to intramuscular testosterone. Two patients had recurrent pain late after testosterone therapy was discontinued. 
they were treated without them knowing it. With sesame oil, they did not improve. When they were switched to real testosterone, they did get better. Dr. Lesser administered small doses of testosterone frequently. He was carrying out physiologic testosterone replacement therapy, and 92% of the male patients improved. He then tried a high-dose injection protocol, six injections over the first week, and that was less successful. Two patients improved, two got worse, one had congestive heart failure. The point here is slow and steady testosterone replacement therapy mimicking mother nature was the most effective approach. 91% of Dr. Lesser's patients improved. There was no side effects at moderate physiologic dosing. The benefits persisted even after the treatment was stopped. How did testosterone help? Well, in 1946, Dr. Lesser hypothesized that testosterone was dilating the coronary arteries, promoting a coronary collateral circulation, and correcting androgen deficiency. Let's fast forward from 1946 to 2009 and study the intervening scientific literature that supports the use of testosterone in the treatment of heart disease in men. My name is James Roberts. I'm board certified in internal medicine and cardiology, and I'm the medical director of comprehensive heart care, the enhanced external counterpulsation of Northwest Ohio, and the Advanced Magnetic Research Institute of Northwest Ohio, and Total Body Balance Medical Weight Loss Center. We are clinicians. Our job is to solve problems, your problems. And if our prior best therapies are not sufficient to solve your problem, then we will reach out and find new therapies, such as external counterpulsation and magnetic molecular energizer therapy. We can also reach back into the 40s and 50s and learn from Dr. Lesser regarding the benefits of testosterone replacement in cardiovascular disease. And we can learn from Dr. Simeon's regarding the benefits of HCG in assisting our patients with physiologic weight loss. And in the future, we may reach out of this world to find new means of assisting our patients heal themselves. But for now, we're firmly grounded in a background of medical science. And as stated, my background is invasive cardiology, and I'm board certified and university trained in that discipline, which means over the first 10 years of my career, I practiced medicine as if my brain was in a box. I was taught by my professors, and I did as I was taught, that the proper focus of cardiology is on anatomy. There is a fixed blockage, a concretion, compromising the supply of oxygenated blood, rendering it insufficient to meet the needs of the exercising heart muscle. So my job was to do a coronary angiogram to determine the severity and extent of the disease process, and then make a recommendation as how we could resupply oxygenated blood to you with a revascularization procedure, be it a balloon angioplasty, bypass surgery, or stent. If the pattern of blockage was such that we could not really help you with a revascularization procedure, then we would use drugs to decrease your heart rate and blood pressure to decrease the demand of the heart for oxygenated blood. It was all about supply, demand, fixed blockages and lesions. We were not involved in prevention because we were taught to be doctors of blockages. I wouldn't see you until you came into the hospital in a crisis with unstable angina, arrhythmia, heart failure, or heart attack. We would admit you to a coronary care unit, stabilize you with medical therapy. We would carry out invasive diagnostic and therapeutic procedures and then refer you on for a definitive procedure, a bypass, a balloon, a stent, or a pacemaker. And of course, this was an exciting approach to medicine, and it's quite gratifying because you do get better. But because our focus is on lesions, a single fixed blockage in, a, in one vessel, and because we weren't paying attention to the circular lesion, the abnormalities in vascular biochemistry and cell biology that cause these narrowings to develop in the first place, then you're gonna be back with more trouble. We'd fix the right coronary artery, you'd come back with a problem in the left. We'd fix your heart, you'd come back with a problem with blood flow to your brain, to your kidneys, your lower extremity. Our therapies are expensive, and they're uncomfortable for you, and they're associated with a significant risk. And you're typically gonna be back with more problems. I became quite frustrated. I felt like I wasn't really helping our patients improve their health. I was practicing revolving door medicine. So out of this frustration, I began to look at what are the factors that cause atherosclerosis to the blockage develop in our patients. 
and I began to treat my patients with antioxidant vitamins, minerals, and essential fatty acids, and this dramatically improved the outcome of my patients. You would still respond to invasive revascularization procedures. Actually, you'd respond a little bit better if we pretreated you with nutritionals, and you were more likely to stay better. The revolving door was slowed down. And of course, this is the, my focus in cardiovascular medicine. I now describe myself as an integrative cardiologist, and that's why you're seeing me. My senior colleague, Dr. Sinatra, who's the best known integrative cardiologist in North America, he and I co-authored a book, Reverse Heart Disease Now, which is a patient manual of integrative uh, cardiology. Now, so our goal is to identify and then resolve all the causes that you as an individual bear that would increase your risk for cardiovascular disease. And early on, we didn't pay much attention to testosterone because we were taught that testosterone causes atherosclerotic vascular disease and estradiol protects against it. And of course, this is brain in the box wrong thinking because men develop cardiovascular disease 10 to 20 years before women. We assume that testosterone caused heart disease and estradiol protects against it. And that is all wrong. Yes. Estradiol protects women from cardiovascular disease, and I'm gonna postulate that testosterone protects men against cardiovascular disease. Women lose estradiol hormonal support in an obvious cataclysmic fashion at the time of menopause. And with the loss of estradiol support, a woman's increase of cardiovascular disease increases. We men begin to lose our protective hormone in our 40s or possibly even in our 30s. But it is a gradual decline that is not obvious. I'm going to hypothesize that we experience cardiovascular disease 10 years before our female car counterparts because we begin to lose our protective hormone, testosterone, 10 to 20 years before women lose their protective hormone, estradiol. So testosterone, we feel, is an important cause of cardiovascular disease. Testosterone deficiency underlies many of the other standard or conventional risk factors, and testosterone deficiency indeed is an independent risk factor or cause of cardiovascular disease. So we're going to replace testosterone in our male patients to prevent and treat cardiovascular disease. Let's look at the physiologic and clinical effects of testosterone replacement therapy as of today, 2009. If we supplement you with testosterone, your testosterone level will increase, sex hormone binding globulin is unchanged to decreased, free testosterone increases, estradiol is unchanged to increase, the ratio of testosterone or free testosterone to estradiol and cort or cortisol will increase, FSH is unchanged to decrease, LH luteinizing hormone will fall in response to testosterone replacement therapy in men. Visceral fat decreases, muscle mass increases, percent body fat increases, muscle strength and bone density will increase. Lipoprotein lipase activity will increase differentially. You will do a better job of clearing lipids from your blood, except you'll also do a better job of clearing lipids out of abdominal or visceral fat. Insulin sensitivity improves. PI-1 and blood viscosity increase your risk for blood clotting. They will decrease. Fibrolinolytic capacity, your ability to dissolve blood clots, will increase with testosterone. Icosanoid metabolism, the prostacyclin to thromboxane A2 ratio will increase. Systemic inflammation will decrease. Your arteries dilate, your red cell mass increases, tissue oxygenation improves. Your lipids improve, cholesterol, LDL, triglycerides fall, HDL is unchanged to increased, lipoprotein A falls, blood sugar control improves in response to testosterone therapy. Inflammatory mediators, Th1 inflammatory mediators that increase your risk of atherosclerosis and autoimmune disease, IL-6, IL-1 beta, C-reactive protein, and all factors mediated by nuclear factor kappa beta will decrease, interleukin-10, a good guy, cytokine will increase, white cell adhesion molecules, VCAM and ICAM will decrease, matrix metalloproteinase activity that degrades the, the fibrous cap over your plaque will decrease. 
clinical effects. That's what you're really interested in. Angina frequency and severity, your need for nitroglycerin will decrease. You can walk farther on the treadmill, less um, ST segment depression. You'll have fewer episodes of chest discomfort, ischemia, symptoms of heart failure, symptoms of lower extremity vascular insufficiency, claudication will decrease. Wound healing, energy levels, sense of well-being will improve. Depression is lessened. Your bones become stronger with increased bone mineral density. Muscle strength, memory improves. Bladder function and erectile function will improve. So this concludes our introduction to testosterone, the heart hormone for men. The next section will be physiology and epidemiology. The DVD will forward to that section or you can go back to the title page and click on the section that you're interested in. We will now discuss the physiology and epidemiology of testosterone replacement therapy in men. The hypothalamus is the interface between the brain, the cerebrum, and the endocrine or hormonal system that is led by the pituitary. The hypothalamus releases GnRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone, that acts on the pituitary gland to release follicle stimulating hormone, FSH, and luteinizing hormone, LH. FSH acts on the ovaries to induce ovulation and the production of estradiol. LH acts on the ovaries to generate progesterone. FSH acts on the testes in men to promote production of sperm. LH acts on the testes to promote the production and release of testosterone into the circulation. So, so testosterone is released by the testicles into the circulation. It enters our cells and binds to a nuclear receptor called the androgen receptor, and that causes a change in the reading of our DNA to differentially increase the production of specific proteins. At the time of puberty, the hypothalamus and the pituitary come to life. They release GnRH, FSH, and LH. The, tes the, the testes respond by releasing testosterone. Testosterone enters our cells, binds to the nuclear receptors, and we begin to change the pattern of protein expression in our bodies, and this causes virilization, the male secondary sexual characteristics characteristic of men in puberty. And many other physiologic effects of testosterone are mediated via a change in protein synthesis insulin sensitivity, lipid metabolism, the anti-clotting characteristics. With respect to cardiovascular function, testosterone can bind to a receptor on the artery wall, causing a rapid vasodilatation. This does not involve altered protein synthesis. It is a direct chemical effect of testosterone to instantly dilate our arteries. In addition, the cells of the cardiovascular system have the androgen receptor in response to testosterone. Protein synthesis is altered to carry out many of the anti-atherosclerotic, anti-plaque effects of testosterone. There's a feedback inhibition mechanism. Testosterone and estradiol can feed back onto the hypothalamus and the pituitary to shut off production of their trophic hormones. FSH and LH. So it is a tightly regulated system. As testosterone and or estradiol rise, the hormones that tell the, the testicles to generate testosterone will be decreased. Sex hormone binding globulin or protein made in the liver binds to and inactivates testosterone and estradiol. Only the unbound or free testosterone can have a biological effect. So as the level of SHBG rises, the level of free testosterone falls, the testosterone effect decreases. SHBG, which binds to and inactivates testosterone, will rise in response to increasing levels of the hormone estradiol. At around age 40 in the average American man, and perhaps around age 30 in men who are chronically ill under inflammatory stress or exposed to toxins, particularly pesticide, testicular testosterone production begins to wane. Testosterone levels in the blood fall. 
This is sensed at the level of the hypothalamus the pituitary gland. They respond by increasing release of GnRH, FSH, and LH, but they basically only whip a dead horse. The testicles aren't responding anymore. Testosterone levels begin to fall. SHBG levels do not fall. So free testosterone levels fall more than total testosterone levels. Stated otherwise, total testosterone falls a little bit. The percent of testosterone bound to SHBG increases. The percentage of testosterone that is unbound or free declines. So total testosterone falls a little bit. Biologically active free testosterone falls a lot. And remember, only the unbound or free testosterone can have a biological effect. Testosterone can also be metabolized into two other hormones. Testosterone can be converted by an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase into DHT or dihydrotestosterone that mediates some of the cardiovascular effects and many of the non-cardiovascular effects, particularly the effects of testosterone on the prostate. Testosterone can also be converted into estradiol. Now we think of testosterone as a male hormone and estradiol as a female hormone, but in both sexes, testosterone and estradiol are present. In men, we would like a high level of testosterone and a low level of estradiol, whereas in fe females, we function best with a low level of testosterone and a high level of estradiol. But testosterone in men can be converted to estradiol by an enzyme called aromatase. Aromatase levels are high in adipose tissue, fat tissue, particularly visceral or abdominal fat. Overweight men, overweight men with visceral adiposity will convert their testosterone into estradiol. Now estradiol will feed back to the hypothalamus and the pituitary and lower GnRH, FSH, and LH leading to decreased production of testosterone in the testes. Estradiol will stimulate production of the binding protein, SHBG, so free testosterone levels fall. Estradiol will compete with testosterone for binding to the angina receptor, having an anti-testosterone effect. Low free testosterone and or high estradiol leads to increased visceral fat accumulation. The end result of this is the aging process or a premature aging process. Free testosterone levels decline. Estradiol levels increase. The free testosterone to estradiol ratio falls. And the free testosterone to estradiol ratio really determines our metabolic fate. Abdominal obesity, which enhances the conversion of testosterone into estradiol, accelerates this unhealthful process. Let's talk about epidemiology, the relationship between a risk factor and the disease that we feel that it causes. I'm going to postulate that there's a permissive relationship between low testosterone and cardiovascular disease and a causal relationship between high estradiol and cardiovascular disease. I'm going to suggest that there's a causal relationship between testosterone and other risk factors. In other words, low testosterone leads to high levels of standard risk factors. And I'll also hypothesize that low testosterone by itself is an independent risk factor or cause of cardiovascular disease. Are these hypotheses correct? Are they scientifically valid? Let's take a look at the literature. Let's look at the prevalence the frequency of low testosterone, otherwise known as hypogonadism, in coronary disease. If testosterone is a cause of coronary disease, we would expect to see lower levels of testosterone in men with cardiac disease as opposed to healthy controls. 900 men with known coronary atherosclerosis, they had a heart cath, they had a 70% blockage. You're going to measure morning testosterone levels. There is a diurnal variation in testosterone, so the convention is to measure levels in the morning will define low testosterone as below 215 nanograms per deciliter or 7.5 nanomoles per liter. Now, if you read the literature on testosterone, and I'm going to suggest that you do, the bibliography of this talk is present on the heartfixer.com website. You can go to PubMed, the online library of Congress, type in testosterone, type in testosterone and coronary disease, or you could type in the last name of the lead author of the papers and this 
researcher's initials and the year, and you can find the article that you're looking for. Now, one thing that's kind of frustrating when you read the scientific literature on testosterone and heart disease, many of the papers, particularly the American papers, report testosterone in metric units. Others report it in molar units. And they will use different scales. So you can't, if you know your own testosterone level and you'd like to plug your value into the literature, you have to be careful because sometimes it'll be in, in a metric, sometimes it'll be in molar, and there'll be different normal ranges. Anyways, for this study, they, they had specific cutoffs for low testosterone, low free testosterone, and then we were going to assess the prevalence of low values, hypogonadism, in these men with cardiovascular disease. Now here in blue is low testosterone, red is low free testosterone, yellow would be low either, with increasing age, and as you can see, low testosterone is not found frequently in young men with cardiovascular disease, but with aging, the prevalence of hypogonadism increases. It's about 25 to 30 percent in seniors with cardiovascular disease. Overall, 23 percent of their patients with cardiovascular disease had low testosterone levels. It was a greater frequency in the obese, 33% versus those who are trim. Remember, abdominal fat lowers testosterone by because aromatase in abdominal fat will convert testosterone into estradiol. Thus, we would expect lower testosterone levels in overweight men. Smokers, the prevalence was 14%, non-smokers 25%. What's going on here? Well, smoking doesn't raise your testosterone levels the, the smokers had heart disease because they were smokers. That was their cause of heart disease. The non-smokers, there had to be other causes of cardiovascular disease. Their cause was low testosterone. The prevalence of low testosterone in the general population will be a function of the age groups you're looking at, but overall it's around 10%. But people with cardiovascular disease have a higher prevalence, 23%. Thus, cardiovascular disease is associated with a tendency to low testosterone, hypogonadism. Okay, what about, is there a relationship between low testosterone and the extent of cardiovascular disease, the number of vessels blocked? Here we're going to look at 69, 30 to 70 year old Albanian men who presented with new onset chest discomfort. They had a stress EKG and if it was abnormal they had a corneal angiogram. They were considered abnormal if they had a greater um, or equal to 70 percent narrowing, normal if they had a normal stress test or modest cornea atherosclerosis. 42 were normal, 27 were abnormal. Measure their morning testosterone levels, look at standard risk factors, correlate the testosterone level with their coronary status. Now, the average testosterone for all the male subjects was 543. Those who did not have cardiac coronary disease, it was higher, 626. Those with coronary disease, it was lower, 416. Nothing new here. But if we look at the extent of cardiovascular disease, one, two, three vessel disease, you see this stepwise association. The more extensive your coronary disease, the greater the number of vessels blocked, the lower is your testosterone. Low testosterone associated with an increased prevalence or risk of cardiovascular disease and an increased risk for extensive uh, coronary artery disease. Now let's look at the relationship between testosterone, estradiol, and the progression of atherosclerosis. We're going to look at 195 Dutch men who were at least 70 years of age. We'll measure standard risk factors, their testosterone and estradiol levels, and the common carotid artery intermediate thickness, or IMT. We measure IMT in the office. We do an ultrasound of the common carotid artery in the neck, and we're not looking for blockages. Instead, we apply digital calipers and measure the thickness of the artery wall in a normal region. This number, when adjusted to, for your age, gives us an index of your plaque forming capacity. The greater your IMT, the greater your risk of developing cardiovascular disease, the greater your risk of an event. The change in your IMT over time gives us even more important prognostic information. If your IMT is stable or progressing only slowly, you're not going to get in any trouble. Conversely, if it's progressing rapidly, you are at high risk for an event because 
progression of IMT in the carotid arteries correlates with progression of obstructive atherosclerosis and an increased event rate elsewhere in your body. So they did the baseline IMT and they repeated the study four years later and they found on average the IMT value progressed at 0.032 millimeters per year. And now we're going to correlate baseline hormone levels with how fast the IMT progressed. Now, if testosterone is protective against cardiovascular disease, we would expect that the individuals with higher testosterone levels would show lower rates of IMT progression. If estradiol is causative of cardiovascular disease in men, we would expect greater rates of IMT progression in the men with the higher baseline estradiol levels, and that is indeed what the researchers found. Here we're going to look at the rate of IMT progression by dividing the men into the first, second, and third tercile of total testosterone and free testosterone. Men in the lower third of free testosterone, their IMT progressed 10 times as rapidly as men with higher levels of testosterone. Conversely, if we look at the rate of progression versus increasing levels, increasing tercios of estradiol, men with low estradiol, low normal, lower third estradiol, progressed far less rapidly than the men with the high estradiol. So low testosterone and high estradiol is associated with a increased risk of disease progression. Let's look at peripheral arterial disease, lower extremity vascular insufficiency. 2,784 amatory Swedish men, you're going to record their baseline hormone levels, standard cardiovascular risk factors, and their ankle brachial ratio, ankle brachial index. You look at blood pressure in the arm, blood pressure at the ankle. If they have lower extremity vascular disease, the ankle brachial index will be lower because there's impaired blood flow to the lower extremity. Now, if you look at the ankle brachial ratio versus quartiles of free testosterone, the lowest fourth versus the second, third, and fourth, if you look at, at that relationship, especially if corrected for differences in estradiol, you can see the lower the testosterone, the worse will be blood flow to the lower extremity. Conversely, men with higher levels of estradiol have lower ankle brachial ratios. The odds ratio of having an abnormal study, an ankle brachial ratio of 90%, that's clinically significant lower extremity vascular disease, rises by 53% if you're in the lower quartile for testosterone versus the remaining men in the second, third, and fourth quartiles. If you're in the upper quartile for estradiol, your risk rises by 48% versus the rest of the men. Now, if you're low testosterone and high estradiol, your risk rises 3.7 fold. So, we've demonstrated that low testosterone and or high estradiol is associated with the extent of cornea disease and in, an increased rate of disease progression in the carotid artery and an increased likelihood of lower extremity vascular disease. All vascular circuits are affected by low testosterone, high estradiol. Well, what's going to happen if we, if we give men estradiol? Remember, in medical school, the, the current thinking was that testosterone caused heart disease and estradiol or estrogen would be therapeutic. The Corny Drug Project was the first large multi-center randomized double-blind preventative study that was carried out. And it was a secondary prevention study. They looked at men aged 30 to 64 with a prior heart attack. They were randomized to receive placebo, niacin, clofibrate, dextrothyroxine, and conjugated estrogens, which is basically Premarin. That is a group of estrogens made by horses that is extracted from horse urine. And so the men received one of these five therapies and they were followed up over four years. 53 U.S. medical centers were involved and it was a double-blind protocol. Neither the subjects nor the researchers knew who was getting what, but there was an oversight committee and the oversight committee halted treatment in the 1,100 men assigned to estrogen after 18 months because they found an increased event rate with 
estrogen administration to men with a prior heart attack. Non-fatal heart attack, the rate 6.2% versus 3%. Total heart attacks, 11% versus 7.5%. Clinical events associated with disease progression and clotting were greater in the men who received estrogen. So high levels of estrogen or estradiol are associated with an increased cardiac event rate administering estrogen preparations to men with heart disease is associated with an increased event rate. Conversely, one of the therapies for metastatic prostate cancer will be androgen ablation therapy. Either orchiectomy, which is castration, or androgen ablation therapy, administering a drug that shuts off testicular testosterone production. Now, if you have metastatic prostate cancer and you undergo androgen ablation therapy, the rate of growth of the cancer will decrease and cancer-related death rate will decrease, but overall death rate will not decrease because cardiovascular event rate and cardiovascular death rate will increase. So estrogen administration to men leads to cardiovascular disease and events. So we've established there's a direct relationship between high estradiol or estrogen molecules and cardiovascular disease in men, a direct relationship between low testosterone and cardiovascular disease. We've presented low testosterone as an underlying and independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So we've established this, but what is the physiologic link? How does low testosterone increase a man's risk of cardiovascular disease? To answer that question, we'll move on to the next section that discusses the effect of testosterone on cardiovascular risk factors. This section explores the relationship between testosterone and the standard cardiovascular risk factors. We ended our prior section on epidemiology and physiology with a question. What is the physiologic link between low testosterone and cardiovascular disease? Well, it's not a physiologic link, it's multiple links between low testosterone and cardiovascular disease. Low testosterone leads to a number of physiologic abnormalities that cause or aggravate cardiovascular disease. Let's explore this literature. We're going to first look at 55 men undergoing diagnostic coronary angiography. We're going to measure their testosterone, free testosterone, estradiol levels, or other risk factors. We're going to record the average percent narrowing of their coronary arteries, and we're going to look for correlations between hormone levels and percent narrowing of the coronary arteries, the extent of the disease, and their other risk factors. And we're going to look at correlation coefficients. The larger the number, the more powerful is this risk factor in determining the extent or severity of cardiovascular disease. Now, in blue, we can see that the testosterone level and free testosterone and HDL are inversely related to the severity extent of cardiovascular disease. In other words, as testosterone, free testosterone, and HDL levels rise, we see less extensive cardiovascular disease. Conversely, the ratio of estradiol to testosterone and the level of the procoagulant or proclotting factor, pi-1, as they rise, we see more extensive cardiovascular disease, as, as we would expect. Testosterone is protective, estradiol promotes cardiovascular disease, and we'll see it in a, in a few other studies. In later studies, it promotes clotting. Let's look at the correlation now between testosterone and the ratio of estradiol to testosterone and some of the clotting and some of the other risk factors. We can see that testosterone is inversely related to the clotting factors, fibrinogen and PI-1, and it's inversely related to insulin. In other words, when your testosterone levels are low, you have higher insulin levels reflecting insulin insensitivity. Conversely, the higher your testosterone, the greater will be your HDL. A, an opposite relationship for estradiol. The greater your estradiol to testosterone um, ratio, the greater will be fibrinogen, so your blood is more viscous. The greater will be your PI-1 level, so you're more likely to form a blood clot. The greater will be your insulin level reflecting insulin insensitivity. The lower will be your level of protective HDL. 
Lipoprotein lipase clears lipids from the blood. It, in the liver, it will take triglycerides out of chylomicrons. Those are the fatty particles that appear in the blood when you eat. If they, lipoprotein lipase will clear triglyceride from the circulating VLDL particles. Let's look at the a relationship between lipoprotein lipase activity in the liver and the circulation and levels of testosterone, estradiol, and the presence or extent of cardiovascular disease. 89 consecutive non-diabetic men referred for heart catheterization. You look at their baseline lab studies, you carry out a coronary angiogram, and you construct a severity score based upon the percent narrowing in 16 segments. You'll also draw labs from 50 healthy control subjects to serve as a comparison group, look for differences in correlations. Now, the patients with cardiovascular disease had lower levels of lipoprotein lipase than did the controls. They were less able to clear lipids from the circulation, and they also had lower levels of testosterone. If we look for predictors or correlates of disease severity, we can show that the higher your lipoprotein lipase level, the less extensive and severe your cardiovascular disease. The greater your HDL level, the less extensive your cardiovascular disease. Conversely, the higher your levels of LDL and triglycerides, the more extensive will be your cardiovascular disease. Testosterone and HDL correlated positively with lipoprotein lipase. We feel that testosterone increases the activity of lipoprotein lipase, you clear lipid from the blood, and you generate more HDL. If that's the case, we would expect that testosterone replacement therapy would have a beneficial effect on lipid levels in men. We're going to look at 22 hypogonadal men. They had low testosterone levels below 350 nanograms per deciliter. Their mean age was 59, a typical uh, cardiovascular patient's age. 11 had isolated hypogonadism, 11 had impaired pituitary function. They all had low testosterone levels. At baseline, you look at their hormone and lipid levels, you do a digital rectal exam to evaluate size, look for abnormalities in the texture of the prostate, and you do an ultrasound exam of the prostate and a blood PSA level, that's prostate-specific antigen, the and the PSA level reflects the size or the volume of the prostate. You do the baseline studies, treat all the men with testosterone, 200 milligrams IM every two weeks, a standard dose. You repeat the lab studies and you do them one week between the injections. No change in diet, exercise level, or other medications. You want to see what effect testosterone has on the physiologic parameters under study. And you see that the testosterone level rises from 130 to 650 at three months and stays high throughout the remainder of the study. You would expect that. The estradiol level also rises from 22 into the mid-30s. Remember, whenever testosterone that we generate endogenously or testosterone that's administered, some of this is going to be converted by aromatase into estradiol. Serum lipid levels. In blue is cholesterol. It falls from 240 to 212. Triglycerides falls from 204 to 165. LDL falls from 159 to 129, but, it, but I'd like to appreciate that the effect is, is slow in onset. When we give you a drug to lower your lipids, we expect to see your lipids fall in a month. With testosterone replacement therapy, remember, testosterone changes the, um, the, the reading of your DNA and changes protein um, levels within your body. That is a slow process, so we need to be patient when we are assessing the effect of testosterone on a physiologic parameter such as lipids. Now the HDL level fell from 45 to 41, but the HDL as a percentage of the total cholesterol did not fall. Whenever we lower your cholesterol, your total cholesterol a lot, the HDL may fall a little bit. In most of the studies, testosterone did not change the HDL or it would go up slightly. In this study, it fell slightly, but insignificantly. Lipoprotein A is a sticky cholesterol. It's under genetic control, and it's an important risk factor it, for men with cardiovascular disease, particularly young men with cardiovascular disease. And LPA is sensitive to different levels of hormones. Estrogen administration will lower the LPA in women, Thyroid hormones affect LPA. If you're hypothyroid, your LPA is high. If we treat your hypothyroidism, your LPA will fall. 
Here we're going to look at the effect of testosterone on LPA levels in 19 healthy men aged 19 through 42. You're going to measure their baseline lipid values and you're going to treat them with 200 milligrams of intramuscular testosterone every week for 20 weeks. Now this is supraphysiologic testosterone replacement therapy. These men had normal testosterone levels. They were not hypogonadal. They were part of the study to see would testosterone serve as a male contraceptive. And so their testosterone levels were normal at 708 and they, they rise up to over 1,000 with testosterone therapy. And then after you stop therapy, their testosterone levels recover. One notion that many people have is that if we treat you with testosterone replacement therapy because your levels are low, that that's going to permanently shut off testicular function. Basically, that your gonads are going to shrivel up and not work anymore. That is not correct. In every study that I've read, if we supplement you with testosterone, your levels will rise. If we stop supplementation, your levels will decline to the baseline level, but they will not fall lower, as in this uh, study here. LPA levels fell from 9.3 to 7.3. But in individuals who have higher baseline levels, of levels above 10, the drop was greater. And we see this same relationship when women with high lipoprotein A's are treated with estradiol. The greater your LPA level, the greater the reduction with estradiol in women and with testosterone in men. Here, their levels fell from 43 to 27. Similar studies have been done of testosterone replacement therapy physiologic testosterone replacement therapy in men with cardiovascular disease, and we see the LPA value decreasing. Now, we've discussed the study showing that testosterone will lower the standard lipids and LPA in the blood, but we're not really concerned with your cholesterol level. We're not doctors of numbers. We're doctors of cardiovascular biochemistry. We're doctors of arteries. We want to make sure that testosterone will decrease the deposition of lipids in the artery wall. Here we're going to look at an experimental study, 80 uh, sexually mature male rats, subject them all to cholesterol overfeeding such that they're increased risk for um, hyperlipidemia and atherosclerosis. You're going to randomize them into four groups. One group receives a sham operation and no hormonal intervention. They're just rats being overfed cholesterol. Another group is subject to castration or orchiectomy and no hormonal intervention. And they have a very low testosterone level. Their testes have been removed. The only source of testosterone then is their adrenal glands, so they have a low testosterone level. A third group is subjected to castration and then they receive testosterone replacement therapy. Testosterone undecanoate is a fat soluble or oral form of testosterone with that, their testosterone levels rose to 19. Another group was subjected to orchiectomy, and they received a higher dose of testosterone. They received 25 milligrams intramuscularly twice a week. They had, they had higher levels of um, testosterone than would a normal um, rat. Now, what happened to the cholesterol levels? These rats were, were subjected to cholesterol overfeeding, so the rats that did not receive hormone therapy and who did not undergo castration had a cholesterol level of 479. The rats that were castrated, so they were overfed cholesterol but they had no testosterone, their cholesterol levels were 763. So in the absence of testosterone, you can't clear cholesterol from your blood and your blood cholesterol level will rise in the rats subject to orchiectomy, but then they were treated with testosterone replacement therapy, their cholesterol levels were much lower. Aortic wall cholesterol, which is what we're really concerned about, 11.6 units in the cholesterol overfed animals that were hormonally intact, and it was much greater, it was twice as high in the rats that were overfed cholesterol and subject to orchiectomy. So if you don't have testosterone, you can't clear lipids from your blood and they will deposit in the artery wall. However, if you replace testosterone, particularly with high doses, not only do you lower the blood cholesterol level, less winds up in the artery wall, and that's what we're, we're, we're most interested in. So testosterone will do this. 
Now let's look at the effect of testosterone on insulin sensitivity. Now the earliest study that I could find was in an Italian journal in 1941. It was not available in English. But they looked at the effect of testosterone on blood glucose levels and they found that testosterone had an insulin-like effect. If you administer testosterone to diabetics, their blood sugar falls. There was no effect on fasting blood sugar in normal individuals, so it was felt to enhance the activity of insulin. This paper was published in 1957 in English, 16 healthy non-diabetic young men, so they were physiologically normal people. You do a glucose tolerance test. You administer a 50 gram glucose drink and first you check the fasting blood sugar and then you record arterial and venous glucose values periodically. You do the baseline glucose tolerance test, then you treat them with 25 milligrams of intramuscular testosterone every other day for 12 injections, and then you repeat the glucose tolerance test to see what effect testosterone has on blood sugar control in healthy young non-diabetic men. These are the curves of arterial and venous sugar. What you find after testosterone administration, arterial levels of blood sugar rise, but venous levels, the level of glucose in the veins, falls. Between the arteries and the veins are the cells. In other words, testosterone increase the arterial venous difference or the cellular uptake of glucose. So insulin sensitivity was improved. You can further analyze the effect of testosterone and insulin sensitivity by doing a glucose insulin sensitivity test. You do the fasting sugar, you administer to the subjects the glucose drink, and you give them a small dose of insulin IV, you see the same situation. The arterial levels fall, but the venous levels fall even more. The cellular uptake of glucose improves. So the effect of testosterone on glucose metabolism in normal people is to improve insulin sensitivity. But we're not treating normal healthy people, we're treating older men with diabetes and cardiovascular disease. What are the effects of testosterone on insulin resistance in men with cardiovascular disease or type 2 diabetes. Here we're going to look at 27 hypogonadal men with type 2 diabetes. Their testosterone levels were low and they had symptoms, irritability, prostatism, depression, fatigue, erectile dysfunction. You do baseline lab studies, randomize the men to receive over three months intramuscular testosterone mixed esters. You know, testosterone is water soluble. If you inject testosterone intramuscularly, you're going to have a rapid peak effect and then it's going to dissipate rapidly. So testosterone will be bound to other organic molecules to produce what's known as a testosterone ester. And the bond between the testosterone and the other organic molecules breaks only slowly. So this is a sustained release form of testosterone suitable for intramuscular administration. So they receive either intramuscular testosterone in standard doses or an intramuscular placebo. You repeat the lab studies at three months, two months after the last injection, and then you stop therapy for a month, and then you cross the subjects over to the opposite treatment. So this was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled crossover study. What you see with placebo therapy, the testosterone level doesn't really change, but it rises significantly by about 30% with intramuscular testosterone, as you would expect. Fasting insulin levels fall. You don't need, the pancreas doesn't need to make as much insulin because it's working better. Insulin sensitivity improves. HOMA is an index of insulin resistance. It falls, the hemoglobin A1C the running three-month average measure of sugar control does not change with placebo therapy. It falls from 7.45 to 7.15 with testosterone. So in diabetics with insulin insensitivity, testosterone administration improves insulin sensitivity, improves blood sugar control. Waist circumference, waist to hip ratio, indices of visceral or belly fat, that's the dangerous inflammatory fat that we want to get rid of, falls with testosterone replacement therapy. 
body mass index, which is your weight in kilogram divided by the square of your height in meters, doesn't change, but percent body fat does, as we'll, we'll, we'll see in future studies, testosterone improves bone mineral density and bone mass, lean muscle mass, but it decreases body fat, so percent body fat will decrease. Let's look at, at the effect of testosterone on eicosanoid or prostaglandin metabolism. Platelets can make thromboxane A2. That is a bad prostaglandin that we get from meat and dairy. This is why we advise against meat and dairy. Prostaglandins are locally acting hormones that mediate a number of physiologic parameters. And we have good prostaglandins and bad prostaglandins. Mother Nature uses a balance. Just as we have the estradiol to testosterone ratio, we have the thromboxane A2 to the prostacyclin ratio. Thromboxane A2 is made from meat and dairy. It's found in platelets. It causes the platelets to be sticky and it causes our blood vessels to constrict. Deleterious effects. Conversely, prostacyclin that we generate from good fats like fish oil is made by the endothelial cells that line the artery. It causes the platelets not to be sticky and it promotes vasodilatation. So we do not want to see a high thromboxane to prostacyclin ratio. The ratio is determined by the fats that we take in and the status of the enzymes that metabolize the fats into their various prostaglandins. Now, the prostacyclin to thromboxane A2 ratio governs vascular wall and platelet physiology. Catechol estrogen, a metabolite of estradiol, inhibits prostaglite, prostacyclin synthesis. As estradiol levels rise with aging in men, particularly overweight men, prostacyclin falls and the prostacyclin to thromboxane A2 ratio falls. The estradiol and estradiol to testosterone ratio in men rises with aging, cardiovascular disease occurs with aging, could the reduction in the prostacyclin to thromboxane A2 ratio occurring due to the rise in the estradiol to testosterone ratio be a mechanism? Let's look at 60 elderly um, male subjects with a prior heart attack. You'll measure their baseline testosterone, estradiol, prostacyclin, and thromboxane levels at baseline and then you're going to randomize them to receive a single injection of intramuscular testosterone. You're going to repeat the labs at three weeks, compare their values with healthy controls. Now what you find in blue is the baseline level of estradiol in the men with cardiovascular disease. You can see it was greater at 15 versus the level 11 in the healthy controls. In response to testosterone therapy, the estradiol level rises slightly because when we administer testosterone, some will be converted to estradiol. We can see that these men with cardiovascular disease had lower baseline testosterone levels compared to healthy controls. That's not a surprise. And in response to testosterone therapy, the levels rise. The all-important estradiol to testosterone ratio was greater in the men with cardiovascular disease. It was twice as high compared to their healthy control uh, colleagues, but in response to testosterone replacement therapy, the estradiol to testosterone level fell, which we would like to see. What effect did this hormonal intervention have on the prostaglandin levels? Well, the thromboxane A2 ratio, the bad guy, was much higher in the men with cardiovascular disease compared to the control population. In response to testosterone, it fell. The prostacyclin level was low in response to testosterone, it rose. The ratio of thromboxane to prostacyclin was high in the men with heart disease and fell nearly to normal in response to testosterone replacement therapy. So testosterone has a favorable effect on the enzymes that convert dietary fatty acids into the, their target prostaglandins. Hematopoiesis, the ability to, of the bone marrow to generate red cells, and tissue oxygenation. Our red cells pick up oxygen in the lungs, transport the oxygen to the cells in the periphery, and then unload the oxygen of the tissues. A molecule called 2,3-DPG promotes the unloading of oxygen to the cells. We want a high level of 2,3-DPG. It promotes tissue oxygenation. 
When you're ill, if you have kidney disease, your ability to oxygenate the periphery will be impaired. You may have low levels of 2,3-DPG. So let's see what happens if we treat men with kidney disease on dialysis with testosterone. Do the baseline lab studies, treat them over 12 weeks with four to 600 milligrams of intramuscular testosterone every week, a fairly high dose. Another group did not receive testosterone, their control group, you repeat the lab studies. 2,3-DPG levels rose significantly with testosterone. Hemoglobin levels and hematic rose. So in these kidney patients, their red cell mass improved, their bone marrow did a better job of making red cells, and as the 2,3-DPG level increased, their cells were able to do a better job of oxygenating the tissues, desirable effects. Testosterone, obesity, and clotting. We're gonna look at 64, 18 to 45 year old healthy men. Their only difference was 40 were abdominally obese. They had a body mass index above 25. 24 were of normal weight, otherwise they're healthy. Look at standard cardiovascular risk factors, particularly labs pertaining to clotting tendency. And let's correlate the laboratory clotting markers with the presence or absence of abdominal obesity and their testosterone status. And what we find here is being overweight is not a healthy condition. It's not a good idea. The waist to hip ratio was greater in the overweight or obese patients as opposed to the trimmer patients. And of course, they had lower testosterone levels. Their fasting blood sugar was higher. It's still in the normal range, but it's higher. And the reason it's not pathologically high is because their insulin levels are greater. They have insulin insensitivity and their pancreas has to respond by overworking and releasing more insulin. So they have a pre-diabetic or early diabetic condition. They have higher blood pressures, their lipids are higher, their HDLs are lower. Pi-1 was three times as high. Pi-1 is a bad guy. Whenever we form a blood clot, we immediately take action to dissolve the blood clot. We're going to convert plasminogen, an inactive protein in the blood, into plasmin. Plasmin digests blood clots. Pi-1 is plasminogen activator inhibitor, which is a long-term, but basically it promotes clotting and keeps you from dissolving blood clots. These otherwise healthy, overweight men, their Pi-1 levels were three times higher than that of their colleagues who were trim. Fibrinogen is the precursor of fibrin, which forms the scab or clot. And the higher your fibrinogen, the more viscous is your blood, the thicker it is, and the greater is your risk of forming a clot. So in these otherwise healthy but overweight men, their tendency to form clot was increased and their ability to digest clots was decreased. If we look at correlation coefficients, body mass index and waist to hip ratio, overweight markers are associated with higher levels of Pi-1 and fibrinogen. Conversely, the higher your testosterone, the lower will be your pro-clotting factors. The lower will be the Pi-1 and the fibrinogen conclusions. Ab abdominal obesity and low testosterone are associated with increased blood viscosity and increased risk for clotting. Testosterone and clot dissolution. Let's look at 55 men with newly diagnosed hyperlipidemia obtain clotting and clot dissolution related labs, correlate that with the testosterone level. As the testosterone level rises, we see lower levels of fibrinogen, lower levels of Pi-1, higher levels of tissue plasminogen activator. TPA is a molecule released by the blood vessel wall to help us dissolve clots. If you have a heart attack and come to the emergency room, we may administer intravenously or into your coronary artery TPA, tissue plasminogen activator, and that will dissolve the clot. The more TPA you have, the less likely you are to form a clot. The higher your testosterone level, the higher your TPA, the less prone you are to clot formation. Conversely, low testosterone, you'll have lower levels of TPA, higher levels of Pi-1, higher fibrinogen, greater risk for clotting. Testosterone and fibrinolytic capacity in men hospitalized with an acute myocardial infarction, an acute heart attack. 30 men hospitalized with chest pain. Eight turned out to not have heart disease. They had non-cardiac 
sources of chest pain. They're the controls. 22 had a heart attack. Baseline lab studies, and you're going to do serial lab values in the heart attack patients treated with fibrinolytic therapy, such as exogenous TPA. And you're going to correlate their testosterone level at the time of presentation with subsequent levels of clotting factors and their clinical outcome. Now, the individuals who had a heart attack, their testosterone levels were lower than the healthy controls, those with non-cardiac chest pain. That's not a surprise. The patients with heart attack had higher levels of SHBG, so they had lower levels of free or bioavailable testosterone and greater levels of estradiol. And we've seen this in all prior studies, men with low levels of free testosterone, higher levels of SHBG, higher levels of estradiol are more likely to have cardiovascular disease. We would expect this situation in the men with heart attack. Now, baseline TPA levels in the men with heart attacks. Those in the lowest quartile for testosterone upon presentation had much lower levels of endogenous TPA, 0.37, than men with quartiles 2, 3, and 4. So if your testosterone levels are low, you're, you're not making as much TPA, you're more likely to have a clot. If we follow the testosterone level over the first six days of the hospital course, we see that testosterone levels fall. And that's due to the fight or flight response, the release of adrenaline and cortisol that will shut off testicular, uh, function, uh, testicular function and testosterone generation, we expect that. TPA activity falls in, in concert with testosterone. Pi-1, a proclotting factor, increases. So low testosterone is associated with low TPA, and as your testosterone level falls with the heart attack, your TPA levels fall and your Pi-1 levels rise. There was an inverse relationship between the baseline testosterone and the release of the enzyme CPK from the heart muscle. The higher your CPK, the more, uh, the greater the volume of heart cells that die. That's associated with a larger heart attack. Men that had pump dysfunction and heart failure had lower levels of testosterone than those who did not. So if your testosterone level is low, you're more likely to have a heart attack. You're more likely to have complications of heart attacks. It hasn't been done yet, to my knowledge, but eventually a study should be done where men presenting with heart attack are treated with testosterone. We would assume that that would have a favorable effect on outcome. Later on, I will show you an animal study similar to uh, acute MI in, in men being treated with testosterone. Now, let's look at the effect of testosterone on the ability of an individual to dissolve blood clots. We're going to look at three men and one woman with cardiovascular disease, one healthy male researcher, and a woman with metastatic breast cancer. We're going to measure baseline fibrinolytic activity, the ability to dissolve blood clots. They use the U globulin lysis time, which is an old study. They take a, a, uh, a vial of your serum and they drop into it a blood clot of standard size and measure how long it takes your serum to dissolve that blood clot. That's an index of your endogenous fibrinolytic or clot dissolving ability. You do the baseline study, administer intramuscular testosterone, monitor their clinical course and the effect of testosterone on clot dissolving function. The healthy researcher in response to testosterone, he became a little bit more healthy. His blood was more rapidly able to dissolve a blood clot. 73 year old diabetic woman with threatened right leg gangrene and a foot ulcer, no improvement with medical therapy. They were set to amputate her foot. They treat her with testosterone. Her ability to dissolve clots increases. Her blood sugar falls and she improved on all fronts, did not require um, uh, amputation. 67-year-old man with progressive lower extremity um, blood flow impairment, claudication, absent pulses, begin testosterone. His rest pain resolved. He could walk farther. He did not need an amputation. His ability to dissolve clots increases. 62-year-old man with heart block, heart failure and angina, incomplete improvement with anticoagulation and diuretic therapy. You begin testosterone. His heart failure improves. He does a better job of dissolving blood clots. 67-year-old woman with metastatic breast cancer, a pathologic hip fracture, 
the hip was involved with metastatic cancer, the bone was weakened and it fractured. You begin IM testosterone, she does a better job of dissolving clots, her pain improved, the bone began to calcify and, he, and the fracture healed. So testosterone has many clinical benefits and one is to promote the dissolution of blood clots. Let's look again at testosterone, abdominal obesity, and insulin function. Abdominal obesity, visceral fat in men, is associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, insulin resistance, and insulin resistance has been linked to low testosterone. In rats, castration, orchiectomy, removal of testosterone leads to insulin resistance and diabetes that will resolve with testosterone supplementation. How will testosterone affect abdominally obese men? Let's again discuss the physiological relationships between testosterone, blood sugar control, and abdominal obesity. Abdominal obesity, visceral fat is inflammatory. It releases inflammatory mediators that causes insulin insensitivity at the level of the liver. The liver is no longer going to listen to the insulin message. The liver begins to make blood sugar. The pancreas has to respond by releasing more insulin that doesn't work very well. Abdominal fat releases aromatase. So the testosterone that you do make is going to be converted into estradiol. As your estradiol levels rise, that feedbacks to the hypothalamus, the pituitary, so levels of LH fall, so you make less testosterone. Testosterone promotes clearance of lipids from blood into the liver, and it prevents the deposition of, of fat into, into visceral fat. So as your testosterone levels fall, you develop more visceral fat. As you develop more visceral fat, you make more aromatase, you convert your testosterone into estradiol, and you have a vicious circle. Conversely, if we treat you with testosterone, that will promote clearance of lipids from your blood through the liver, and it blunts deposition of, of triglycerides into your belly fat. As a matter of fact, it decreases belly fat. If we decrease belly fat, we decrease inflammation, we lower estradiol, you trim down, and insulin sensitivity improves. So visceral fat and low testosterone are big problems. If you lose weight, testosterone will rise. If we give you testosterone, we'll help you lose weight. That's the, those, that's the relationship that we want to um, exploit in our patients. Testosterone, abdominal obesity, and insulin function. Here's a study of 31 generally healthy men above 40 years of age. They were abdominally obese with waist hip ratios above 0.9. None yet had diabetes or high blood pressure. They were not selected for low testosterone status. They were simply selected for being overweight and still overtly healthy. You're going to do baseline measurements of body composition, prostate status, and hormonal levels and insulin sensitivity. Randomize them to receive over nine months a testosterone cream, five grams every morning, or a placebo cream. You repeat the measurements at nine months. A double blind protocol was followed. Neither the subjects nor the researchers knew who was getting the active testosterone cream or placebo cream. And what you find there were no hormonal changes with placebo therapy. Testosterone levels increased by 19% with active therapy. Sex hormone binding globulin fell by 7%, so free testosterone rose more by 24%. Estradiol levels increased minimally from 27 to 32 or 20%. Urine cortisol fell by 21%. Testosterone's anabolic, it builds. Cortisol, the stress hormone, breaks down or burns. In response to testosterone replacement therapy, the catabolic hormone cortisol falls, and that's desirable. Lean body mass increases by 2%. Body weight falls by 2%. So body fat falls by 6%. Visceral fat, the dangerous inflammatory fat, falls by 9%. Fasting sugar falls 7%. Insulin levels fall by 13% because insulin sensitivity manifested here as the glucose disposal rate increased by 23%. Cholesterol falls by 12%, triglycerides by 
Systolic blood pressure falls 4.4%, diastolic by 6%. No change in prostate volume, PSA, or urinary flow parameters. The subjects who received testosterone, 60% noted an increased sense of well-being versus only 10% with placebo therapy. Another study of oral testosterone undecanoate over eight months in men with abdominal obesity. Testosterone, free testosterone, and the testosterone to estradiol ratio rises, levels of SHBG fall. There's a decrease in abdominal adipose tissue, an improvement in insulin sensitivity, cholesterol and BP levels fall. The benefit was greatest in men with lower baseline testosterone levels. Again, we are utilizing testosterone replacement therapy. We want to achieve physiologic on treatment levels. So it stands to reason the lower your baseline testosterone level, the greater will be your relative benefit with physiologic testosterone replacement therapy. There were no side effects. Prostate volume increased by 12%. We'll talk about that in a later section. The PSA was stable and there were no genital urinary adverse symptoms and there was an increased sense of well-being that we see universally in response to testosterone replacement therapy. Testosterone and leptin, 20 men with type 2 diabetes and hypogonadism, their testosterone level was low and they had symptoms of androgen deficiency. You'll do the baseline measurements, then randomize them to receive over three months intramuscular testosterone ester, sustenon every two weeks or intramuscular placebo. You repeat the measurements. One month later, after a washout period, you cross them over to the opposite therapy. And during active testosterone replacement therapy, the testosterone levels will rise. Waist circumference falls, leptin levels fall. Leptin is a hormone that is elaborated in response to food intake. And as leptin levels rise, that sends a signal to our brain that we are full, so we stop eating. Individuals who are overweight suffer from leptin resistance. Their brain no longer responds to leptin. A reduction in leptin indicates that testosterone improved physiology, improved insulin sensitivity, lowered visceral fat mass. So leptin falls in response to testosterone. To summarize, testosterone, abdominal obesity, and insulin function, which is pretty important because two-thirds of American adults are overweight, abdominal obesity in men is associated with low testosterone, high leptin, high estradiol, high cortisol, insulin insensitivity, predisposing you to high blood pressure, increased blood viscosity, hyperlipidemia, and an increased risk for clotting. Treatment with testosterone will increase testosterone levels, decrease cortisol levels, abdominal obesity is lessened, leptin levels fall, insulin sensitivity improves, glucose, lipid, blood pressure, and clotting parameters all will improve. The metabolic effects of testosterone replacement therapy, lipoprotein lipase is differentially activated. We do a better job of clearing lipids from the blood through the liver, but we are less likely to deposit dietary lipids into abdominal fat. Insulin sensitivity improves. The pro-clotting factors, PI-1 and blood viscosity, fibrinogen falls. Blood clot dissolving capability, fibrinolytic capacity improves. The prostacyclin to thromboxane A2 ratio will increase. Red blood cell mass improves. If we're anemic, our hemoglobin rises. 2,3 DPG levels increase. We do a better job of dumping oxygen into our tissues. Tissue oxygenation improves. Your cholesterol, your LDL, your triglyceride levels will fall. HDL tends to be unchanged to a slight increase. Lipoprotein A levels will fall. Blood sugar control will improve. And so we've covered the relationship, the links between low testosterone and cardiovascular disease. Low testosterone leads to a number of atherosclerotic risk factors, particularly overweight, insulin insensitivity, increased blood viscosity, and an increased clotting tendency. In the next section, we will explore the relationship between testosterone and immune function and inflammation particularly with respect to the role of the immune system in the initiation and progression of cardiovascular disease. In this section, we will explore the relationship between testosterone, 
immune function and inflammation. This is a fairly technical section. It's of great interest to me because I understand that atherosclerosis is really a chronic maladaptive response to the immune system to what it perceives as infection of the artery wall with oxidized and glycated lipids. LDL, particularly small dense LDL particles, and lipoprotein A will traverse the endothelial cells into the artery wall. Now, LDL cholesterol is not a bad guy. It's food. All of our cells, endothelial cells, artery wall cells, immune cells all have an LDL receptor that will bind to and internalize LDL as food. LDL that is not utilized as food can be subjected to free radical oxidation. The LDL is oxidized and by free radicals generated as a byproduct of normal metabolism, this situation is aggravated if we are low in antioxidant minerals such as selenium and zinc or if we have been exposed to free radical generating toxic metals such as lead, cadmium, and mercury, which unfortunately is the situation in Western societies. So our LDL cholesterol can become oxidized. Now, when an LDL particle is oxidized, it undergoes a configurational change, it no longer fits in the LDL receptor. It can no longer be used as food. These oxidized LDL particles clump together into these globs in the subendothelial space, in the inner lining of the artery wall. And they can no longer be recognized by the nutritional LDL receptor. Instead, monocytes and macrophages, immune cells in the circulation within the artery wall, will recognize the oxidized LDL by its scavenger receptor. It looks to the cells of the immune system like it's a microbe. So the macrophages engulf or phagocytize the oxidized LDL, thinking it's a microbe. The oxidized LDL, however, is toxic to the macrophage and kills it. So we have dead macrophages full of oxidized lipids. Those are basically pus cells within the artery wall, and we call this the fatty streak. So the oxidized LDL looks like a microbe. It's taken up by the immune cell, the macrophage, and it kills the macrophage. But before it kills the macrophage, the macrophage has a chance to send out a distress signal. Chemotactic molecules such as MCP, monocyte chemotactic protein, are released into the circulation in the area of the artery in which this is occurring and that pulls white cells from the circulation into the artery wall in this region. White cell adhesion molecules, VCAM and ICAM, are elaborated by the endothelial cells lining the artery wall to make it easier for the white cells to stick to the artery wall and enter the artery. So these white cells, they're armed and activated their toll-like receptors are activated. They know there's a problem. They've been brought in to deal with this infectious threat. So these armed macrophages make a lot of free radicals. You know, the reason we make free radicals is to kill bacteria. So they will engulf the oxidized LDL and degrade it into tiny little snippets. And then these macrophages will present tiny little snippets of oxidized LDL protein, amino acids chains, 8 to 20 amino acids long. They will present them on specialized antigenic determinate presentation molecules to T lymphocytes. We have a trillion different types of T lymphocytes in our bodies. They're taught in our thymus to ignore all the proteins that we make, but to react to any foreign protein. So if you receive a kidney from anyone who's not an identical twin, those proteins are foreign to you. Your T cells will want to attack them. That's why you need immunosuppressive therapy. 
any proteins made by a bacteria or any other invader will be recognized as abnormal and your immune system will react against them. Now, while the LDL is a normal molecule that we would tolerate, proteins from the oxidized LDL are abnormal and our immune system will react to them and we will now mount an immune response in the artery wall against oxidized LDL. So when these T cells are activated, they can take one or three pathways. Now, if a T cell is exposed to its target molecule in a non-inflammatory environment, it becomes a T regulatory or suppressive cell, which tones down the immune system. That's the basis for immune modulation therapy. A, an activated T cell can become a Th2 cell. Th2 cells help our body handle blood-borne bacteria. The Th2 cells assist B lymphocytes or plasma cells to make antibodies. Th2 cells tend to protect against atherosclerosis. They make anti-inflammatory, or at least from the perspective of atherosclerosis, anti-inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-4, interleukin-10. Now our problem is Th1 immune function. Th1 T cells make inflammatory cytokines such as tumor necrosis factor, interferon gamma, IL-12 that help monocytes and macrophages kill intracellular bacteria they've engulfed and they will help monocytes and macrophages attack oxidized LDL. So Th1 immune function, Th1 cytokines promote atherosclerosis. We would like to have a dominance of Th2 and Th2 cytokines like IL-10 and IL-4 over Th1 function and their pro-atherosclerotic cytokines such as TNF interferon gamma. That is not the situation in individuals with autoimmune disease and coronary atherosclerosis. Now, inflammatory cytokines, immune mediators, initiate and propagate cardiovascular disease and mediate the enlargement of the plaque. But an enlarging plaque really doesn't bother us that much. When it becomes high grade, we can have some angina, but it doesn't kill us. We die when a plaque ruptures, cracks, or fissures and releases its lipid gruel into the lumen, the flow area, or serves as a nidus for a clot. Now, when we are slowly forming these plaques, we will cover them with a fibrous cap full of collagen connective tissue. Th1 immune cells and macrophages release enzymes called matrix metalloproteinases they are activated by enzymes released from activated mast cells. Those are cells that are involved in allergy that, that are involved in this inflammatory soup. Anyways, these matrix metalloproteinases will degrade the fibrous cap. And in response to these immune inflammatory Th1 mediators will cause a rent to form in the fibrous plaque, destabilizing the plaque causing obstruction of blood flow or a clot. The vulnerability in vulnerable plaque is associated with high levels of Th1 inflammation. We will show that testosterone deficiency is associated with hyperactive Th1 immune function. Conversely, that testosterone therapy will lower Th1, raise Th2, retard the progression of atherosclerosis, and protect against disruption of the fibrous plaque. Testosterone will take some of the vulnerability out of the plaque. Now, first I'd like to present the relationship between testosterone and another TH1 autoimmune disease that you're familiar with, rheumatoid arthritis. I'm gonna to propose to you that rheumatoid arthritis and coronary atherosclerosis are really one and the same disease with different target organs. If we biopsy the joint of an RA patient and look at it under the microscope, the cells will be very similar to what we see in an active plaque in a coronary patient. 
We're going to look at 36 men with long-standing rheumatoid arthritis and 70 age-matched healthy controls. Now, 24 of the 36 RA patients were on prednisone. Prednisone suppresses the entire immune system. It will suppress the immune cells mediating the RA, but it will also suppress the entire immune system, leading to many side effects. 12 were not on prednisone. Now, the healthy control patients had a testosterone level of 4 to 32. The RA patients who were not on prednisone, their levels were lower. Those on prednisone were the lowest of all. The healthy controls had fairly low levels of LH. Those with RA who were not on prednisone had higher levels. So in the situation of rheumatoid arthritis, there's inflammation. The testicles are affected by the inflammation. They make less testosterone. The low testosterone levels are sensed at the level of the pituitary that responds by making more luteinizing hormone, and that will support the testosterone level. In the RA patients treated with prednisone, prednisone suppresses the entire immune system. It also has an adverse effect on testicular function. So the RA patients not on prednisone had lower levels than healthy controls. Those on prednisone had the lowest levels of all. Prednisone compromises testicular function. Conversely, what happens if we treat men with RA with testosterone. Here's a small study of seven men with RA, eight health, and the eight control subjects had standard osteoarthritis, non-immune mediated arthritis. Now, none were on prednisone, all were on non therapy like aspirin or Motrin. Do the baseline studies, treat the RA patients with oral testosterone, reevaluate in six months. Now, the RA patients had lower baseline testosterone levels versus the controls, the OA patients, and in response to testosterone, their levels rose to normal. T-cell subsets. CD4 cells are pro-inflammatory. They will aggravate RA and atherosclerosis. CD8, those are the killer cells. They will kill rogue cells. They will kill cancer cells. The CD8 levels were lower in the RA patients, and they responded to testosterone by increasing. Mother Nature does everything with ratios. So a high CD4 to C8 ratio is associated with abnormal immune immediate inflammation, autoimmune disease. RA in these patients, atherosclerosis in coronary patients, in response to testosterone, the CD4 to CD8 ratio falls into a more desirable range. The erythmocyte sedimentation rate a lab marker of inflammation, similar to the C-reactive protein we use today, fell in response to testosterone. Rheumatoid factor, another lab study of disease activity in RF patients fell. The number of tender joints, a symptom measure, fell, and the requirement for non medications fell. So testosterone was therapeutic in another TH1 autoimmune disease, rheumatoid arthritis. Let's see what it does in coronary atherosclerosis. First, let's look at the effect of testosterone on cytokine levels. 69 men with angiographically confirmed coronary disease. They had at least 70% narrowings. 20 had single vessel disease. 18 had two vessel disease. 31 had three vessel disease. Now, 17 were hypogonadal. 22 were borderline. 30 had normal testosterone levels. We're going to measure inflammatory cytokines, bad guys, TH1 mediators, TNF, IL-1 beta, IL-6, and the anti-inflammatory good guy, TH2 mediator, IL-10. Look for correlations and relationships. Now, let's look at interleukin-1 beta as a function of the number of arteries narrowed. As we go from 1, 2 to 3 vessel disease, we see higher levels of interleukin-1 beta. The greater the TH1 inflammation, the more extensive the coronary disease. IL-10 levels also rose with the extent of coronary disease. Now this gets a little bit confusing. IL-10 is a good guy. When we are growing plaques with TH1 inflammation, the body does want to compensate with an equal and opposite TH2 response to stabilize the plaque. In individuals with stable atherosclerosis, 
you'll see a balance between TH1 and TH2. In unstable atherosclerosis, the TH2 modulation is lost. These patients had stable corneal disease. If you had repeated the analysis in individuals with unstable plaque, you would have seen lower levels of IL-10. So IL-10 is protective. The reason it rose with the extent of disease was as a compensatory mechanism keeping them stable. Now, interleukin-6, another TH1 immune mediator, was higher only in individuals with three vessel disease. TNF levels didn't really rise or fall with the extent of the uh, coronary disease. Now, here we got interleukin-1 beta levels rising as the number of vessels blocked increases. Here we have interleukin-1 beta levels rising as testosterone levels fall. So with low testosterone, you have high interleukin-1 beta. In a prior section, we demonstrated that as testosterone levels fall, we have more extensive cardiovascular disease. Now, was the low testosterone the cause of the high interleukin-1 beta and the more extensive coronary disease? Or was the high level of the inflammatory cytokine responsible for the low testosterone of the more extensive cardiovascular disease? Actually, it's both. Inflammation lowers testosterone. Testosterone will lower inflammation. Let's, let's put this to the test. Let's look at the effect of testosterone on C-reactive protein. That's the inflammatory media that you're most familiar with in elderly men. 60 middle-aged elderly men, they were presenting to clinic with urologic complaints. They were all hypogonadal with low testosterone levels. You do a baseline C-reactive protein, the inflammatory marker, and an AMS, or the aging male symptom scale, which is a symptom scale of androgen deficiency, fatigue, erectile dysfunction, insomnia, prostatism. You're gonna treat them all with intramuscular, fat-soluble testosterone undecanoate, 1,000 milligrams every 12 weeks, reevaluate at 12 months. Their hypogonadal symptoms, the AMS score, fell with testosterone replacement therapy and look at their C-reactive protein. It fell from 3.5 to 2.2. If we stratify their symptoms of hypogonadism with quartiles of C-reactive protein, men with lower CRP, lower inflammation, had fewer symptoms of hypogonadism. Their symptoms were due to inflammation. The inflammation was due to low testosterone. You treat them with testosterone, you quiet down inflammation, and the men feel better. This shows that testosterone will lower elevated levels of immune uh, inflammatory mediators. Another study of testosterone inflammation, 25 men attending an outpatient andrology clinic, 20 had coronary disease, two with heart failure, nine with diabetes, 10 with high blood pressure. Do baseline lab studies, randomize them to receive on days 1, 14, and 28, intramuscular testosterone or placebo, repeat the lab studies on day 30, then you cross them over to the opposite regimen in a double-blind randomized format. Placebo had very little effect on testosterone. Testosterone levels rose significantly with intramuscular therapy. Tumor necrosis factor alpha, a TH1 cytokine, rose slightly with placebo therapy and fell significantly with testosterone. In our prior study, CRP fell with testosterone. In this study, TNF alpha fell. Interleukin-1 beta fell with testosterone. IL-10, the good guy, rose. So TH1 cytokines fall, TH2 cytokines, the good guys, will rise. A study of, in experimental atherosclerosis, male New Zealand white rabbits. You randomize them to standard diet, no castration, no hormonal intervention, just the, the, the native situation. Another group is put on a high cholesterol diet, a sham operation, no hormonal intervention. A third group is put on a high cholesterol diet and subject to castration, so they have no testosterone. A fourth group is put on the high cholesterol diet they are subjected to castration, then they're put on testosterone replacement therapy to give them a normal physiologic testosterone level. Sacrifice all the animals at 12 weeks, 
evaluate aortic wall, lipid deposition, and plaque, and look at pertinent lab studies. Now, testosterone levels on the standard diet was 600. On a high cholesterol diet, testosterone levels rise. What do we make testosterone from? Cholesterol. A high cholesterol diet, a high red meat diet, will increase testosterone levels in mice and in men. Castration, of course, will, will, will lower testosterone dramatically. The only source is the adrenal glands. But castration and testosterone replacement therapy rendered these animals eugonadal. They had a normal on-treatment testosterone level. Now, percentage of the lumen involved with plaque. Normal animals with a standard diet, they have clean arteries. High cholesterol diet, without orchiectomy, they actually begin to fill up with plaque. 16% of the artery wall is covered with plaque. A high cholesterol diet and castration, so you have no testosterone to help you remove cholesterol from the circulation, you have a great deal of plaque. Castration and testosterone replacement therapy is associated with less plaque. The thickness of the fibrous cap. We want a thick fibrous cap to make our narrowings, our plaques, non-vulnerable. In the animals that were deprived of testosterone with castration, they had thinner fibrous caps. Their plaques would be more, more vulnerable. The collagen content of the plaque, you want a lot of collagen in the plaque to make it tough so the plaque won't rupture. In the absence of testosterone, there's less collagen, rendering the plaques more vulnerable, more prone to rupture. Inflammatory cytokine levels. IL-6 is a Th1 cytokine. ICAM is a white cell adhesion molecule that's going to pull white cells into this inflammatory plaque. MMP, these are the degradative enzymes that degrade collagen and tend to rupture the fibrous plaque. Now, in the animals on the standard diet, the levels are low. With a high cholesterol diet and no surgery, the levels are high. So a high cholesterol diet, some of that can become oxidized. That will cause abnormal immune function. But the high cholesterol diet and testosterone ablation, castration, they have the highest levels of cytokines. High cholesterol diet, castration type, and, and um, testosterone replacement therapy will lower the levels of the inflammatory cytokines. Testosterone and nuclear factor kappa beta translocation. This is quite technical, but it's a very important study. It explains a final common pathway or common denominator means by which testosterone blunts the generation of inflammatory mediators. We're going to take endothelial cells, arterial wall cells from a, a newborn human umbilical veins. So we have pristine human cells, endothelial cells. And you're going to put them in tissue culture and you're going to measure levels of tissue factor pathway inhibitor. That protects against abnormal clotting. It's a good guy. You're going to look at tissue factor pathway inhibitor messenger RNA. That is a measure of whether you are um, reading your DNA in such a fashion to make this good guy stuff. And you're going to look at translocation of nuclear factor kappa beta, which I'll get into in a minute. You'll measure these levels before and after you add to the system testosterone, tumor necrosis, factor alpha, an inflammatory mediator that would rise in autoimmune disease or in a systemic infection. Or the third group, you get TNF with testosterone pretreatment. Will testosterone blunt any deleterious activities, deleterious effects of this Th1 immune mediator? Now, tissue, tissue factor pathway inhibitor, a good guy, rises with testosterone. That's not a surprise, so you're less likely to form clots it falls in response to the inflammatory mediator. If you pretreat the cells with testosterone, you're going to blunt the deleterious effect of the inflammatory mediator. And if you look at messenger RNA, which is a, a, a measurement of, of how much, how aggressively you're reading the DNA to make the tissue factor pathway inhibitor, it rises with testosterone. 
testosterone binds the nuclear angina receptor and changes the pattern of protein reading in a beneficial fashion. So you make more messenger RNA and that will translate into more tissue factor pathway inhibitor protein. Conversely, in response to the, to the inflammatory meter TNF, the reading of the DNA for this anti-clotting factor is blunted. So testosterone and the inflammatory mediators are affecting how we read our DNA, differentially affecting whether good or bad proteins are generated. And this is the deleterious effects of the inflammatory mediator is blunted by the testosterone. Now, nuclear factor kappa beta is found in the cell fluid, the cytoplasm, in an inactive form. In response to inflammatory mediators, it is inactivated, it translocates in the nucleus and mediates the abnormal DNA reading patterns. It is a final common pathway through which a host of inflammatory mediators cause deleterious effects on the levels of good and bad proteins in our cells and our circulation. Testosterone blunts translocation of nuclear factor kappa beta into the nucleus. That's going to have a universally favorable effect on the generation of all inflammatory mediators. TNF-alpha increases it. Testosterone blunts that activity. So this is why you know, testosterone doesn't have a different effect on this whole alphabet soup of inflammatory mediators. It works on the final common pathway. It blocks the deleterious change in DNA reading that leads to deleterious proteins by blocking the translocation of nuclear factor kappa beta in the nucleus. So that's a, that's a technical, um, very technical study, but it explains many of the immune benefits of testosterone. Another complicated study, testosterone T cells, antigen presenting cells and cytokines, 13 men with type 2 diabetes, eight healthy controls, they're all age 55 or older, none had hypogonadal symptoms. At baseline, you're gonna measure cytokine production by the immune cells, and then cytokine production after stimulating them with bacterial um, membrane, lipopolysaccharide, or interfering gamma. You would expect the immune cells to respond to that stimulus with increased production of cytokines. Then you treat the diabetics for a year with testosterone, you repeat the studies. The diabetics had lower levels of testosterone at baseline versus the healthy controls. That's not a surprise. In response to testosterone therapy, their levels rose. The percentage of their T cells that were CD4 plus was greater, and the percentage of, of T cells that were CD8 plus were less. So they had a high CD4 to CD8 ratio associated with propensity to atherosclerosis and autoimmune disease. In response to testosterone, the situation was reversed. CD4 fell, CD8 rose, which is going, uh, motion in the right direction. The percentage of monocytes that would spontaneously generate IL-6 or TNF was a little bit lower in the diabetics than in the normal patients. In response to testosterone, not a whole lot happened. The ability of the monocytes to generate IL-6 and TNF following an appropriate physiologic stimuli was not impaired. The point here is testosterone downregulates abnormal baseline, abnormally upregulated immune function, but it will not inhibit the ability of your immune response to um, upregulate in response to an appropriate stimuli such as an infection. If we suppress your immune system with prednisone, yes, you have less inflammation, less autoimmune disease, but in response to an infection, your immune system cannot upregulate appropriately. That is not the case with testosterone. Antigen presenting cells that will degrade proteins and present them to the T lymphocytes also generated less inflammatory mediators at rest, but did re still respond to appropriate stimulation. TNF and testicular function, 80 sexually mature male Wistar rats, you do baseline measurements, and then you put in an IV and treat them with TPN, total parental nutrition, 
Um, IV nutrition as we would administer to a patient who was ill and unable to eat. Another group got TPN and they put in tumor necrosis factor alpha. This would mediate systemic infection. A low dose of inflammation, a higher dose of inflammation. Sacrifice and evaluate one third of each group at days one, three, and six. So testosterone levels don't change in response to intravenous nutrition. But in response to TNF, which was a mimic of, of bacterial uh, infection or autoimmune activity or upregulated Th1 function, you could see that testosterone levels declined. Testicular weight was unchanged with intravenous nutrition. The testicles basically shriveled up and quit functioning in response to chronic inflammation. So this is why in men with chronic inflammation, testosterone levels are lower because the inflammatory mediators are compromising testicular function. Testosterone and the IL-10 versus IL-2 ratio. IL-10 and IL-4 are good guys, IL-12 is the bad guys. We're gonna look at T lymphocytes recovered from male and female mice. You'll stimulate the T cells non-specifically and look at the profile of cytokines they elaborate. The female mice in blue make a lot less of the protective IL-4 and IL-10 versus the male mice. The female ma mice make more IL-12 Th1 than do the male mice. The same amount of inferior gammon. Um, in animals and in humans, women have more autoimmune disease, more RA, more lupus than do men because testosterone is an immune modulator, estradiol tends to be an immune stimulator. Now, you're gonna take these female mice and treat them with testosterone replacement therapy, pellets of dihydrotestosterone placed under their skin. Now, what you'll see is in response to testosterone administration to women, they make more of the good guy IL-10 and less of the IL-12. Their cytokine profile is now more similar to their male counterparts, less Th1, more Th2. So testosterone upregulates IL-10, IL-4, Th2, and downregulates Th1, IL-12. Testosterone promotes Th2, inhibits Th1. Testosterone protects against autoimmune disease and atherosclerosis. So we've shown in this section that testosterone has beneficial effects on immune function. It won't compromise normal immune function, it won't increase your susceptibility to infection, but it'll tone down abnormally upregulated Th1 immune function that mediates autoimmune disease and atherosclerosis. IL-6, IL-1 beta, CRP, all inflammatory mediators mediated by nuclear factor kappa beta will decrease. IL-10, IL-4, Th2 increases. The white cell adhesion molecules, VCAM and ICAM fall, so there's less propensity for white cells to enter the artery wall and participate in plaque formation. Matrix metalloproteinase activity is decreased, thus the fibrous plaque is less likely to rupture or less likely to have an event. So we've talked about how low testosterone increases the risk of cardiovascular disease, the rate of disease progression, the extent of cardiovascular disease, how low testosterone is associated with upregulated deleterious immune activity and an increased rate of plaque rupture. We've laid the found work for therapeutic benefits of testosterone in men with cardiovascular disease. In the next section, we will present the clinical study showing the benefits of testosterone replacement therapy in men with cardiovascular disease. In this section, we're gonna examine the studies that demonstrate a clinical benefit of testosterone replacement therapy in men with coronary disease. First, let's look at the effect of testosterone on coronary tone. We're gonna to take 21 middle-aged men 13 had symptomatic coronary disease, eight were overweight. They all had undergone cardiac catheterization. We're gonna study an artery that was not severely diseased, it did not have a high grade narrowing. We're gonna do a baseline measure of coronary diameter and the rate of coronary blood flow, followed by a repeat measurement 
after we inject into the coronary artery various doses of testosterone, replacement doses and supraphysiologic doses. And we're going to look at the effect of intracoronary testosterone on coronary artery diameter. And in response to intracoronary testosterone, some spills into the veins and the, and the testosterone levels go up as you'd expect. Coronary artery diameter increases by 3 to 4.5 percent in response to the injection of testosterone. Now this is a direct chemical effect mediated via testosterone receptors on the endothelial cells that line the coronary arteries. This does not involve protein synthesis. It does not involve activity at the nuclear receptor. This is a direct vasodilatory effect of testosterone. Now, a 3 to 4 percent increase in coronary diameter is significant. If you take a nitroglycerin, your arteries will dilate 5 percent. If you smoke a cigarette, your arteries will constrict by 5 percent. If your blood sugar goes up to 400, they will constrict by 4 percent. So a 3 to 4.5 percent dilatation in the coronary artery is clinically significant. If this is the case, we would expect that intravenous testosterone would dilate the coronary arteries and might improve one's stress EKG findings. In this study, they took 14 men with coronary disease and abnormal stress EKG studies. On the treadmill, we push you to the point where the supply of oxygenated blood is insufficient to meet the needs of the exercising heart muscle. You will have chest pain, your EKG changes, it, there's a sign called ST depression. That means you've developed coronary insufficiency in response to treadmill stress. Now, these men were not selected for low testosterone level. They were just men with coronary disease. So in this study, you withdraw all their cardiac medications, and you do a stress EKG 30 minutes following the single intravenous administration of 2.5 milligrams of testosterone or IV placebo. And then you repeat the study two days later after you cross the patient over to the opposite therapy. So it was a randomized double-blind crossover study. Time to ST depression and total treadmill time increased by one and a half minutes. That's highly significant. Treadmill time increases by one minute following bypass surgery, following stent placement, or with ECP, or other nutritional measures such as arginine, coenzyme Q, magnesium, or ribose. Here, treadmill time increases by one and a half minutes in response to testosterone due to its acute vasodilatory effects. Nearly all the subjects improved with an increase in treadmill time. Now, beta blockers and nitrates and calcium blockers will improve your treadmill time. Why? Because they lower your heart rate and blood pressure. They don't improve blood supply but they decrease heart rate and blood pressure, they decrease demand. The patients in response to testosterone, they could walk farther and exhibit greater heart rates and blood pressures. In other words, testosterone doesn't decrease demand, it doesn't decrease heart rate and, and blood pressure, it increases supply. Now, the improvement in the stress EKG was not really related to their peak testosterone level, but rather the incremental improvement in your stress EKG was related to the incremental rise in your testosterone level. While all the men improved, even men with normal testosterone levels, the men with the lower pretreatment testosterone levels got the greater kick with the intravenous testosterone. Well, IV testosterone works, but you can't go through your life giving yourself periodic intravenous injections of testosterone, let's look at the effect of transdermal testosterone on treadmill parameters. 46 men medically treated with coronary disease, they had stable angina, all had abnormal stress EKG studies with ST depression and angina. They all had known coronary disease or a prior heart attack. Their mean testosterone level was 13.6 and the normal range was 7.5 to 37. So most of the men had normal or low normal testosterone levels, similar to what we see in a clinical population. You do a baseline stress EKG and a SF36 health questionnaire, which is a measure of quality of life. 
you randomize the men with coronary disease to receive a testosterone 5 milligram patch or a placebo patch, you recheck the study parameters at 6 and 14 weeks. Testosterone levels rose in response to supplementation. They did not rise with placebo. Estradiol levels rose minimally with testosterone, and they also increased minimally with placebo. Time to ST segment depression did not change significantly with placebo. It increased by 52 seconds, basically a minute, or 17% in response to testosterone. Just as a single dose of IV testosterone improves treadmill time, chronic therapy with topical testosterone also improves treadmill time. And again, the greater the rise in testosterone, the greater was the benefit. All men improved, but those with lower testosterone got the greater kick or relative benefit. Intramuscular testosterone, ischemic threshold quality of life. 10 hypogonadal patients with known coronary disease, abnormal stress EKG studies, they have low testosterone levels and known coronary disease. You do a baseline assessment, keep them on their usual meds, randomize them to receive intramuscular testosterone every two weeks or placebo, and then you repeat the baseline studies and then cross them over to the opposite therapy. Testosterone levels do not rise in response to placebo therapy. Of course, testosterone and bioavailable, another measurement similar to free testosterone, respond to supplementation. Now, TNF alpha levels rose slightly with placebo and fell significantly with testosterone from 4.1 to 2.9. Cholesterol levels rose slightly with placebo, and they fell with testosterone. So lipids improve, inflammatory mediators improve with intramuscular testosterone in men with coronary disease. Time to ST segment depression also improves by a little over a minute. Functional status improves dramatically. The ADAMS score is a measure of hypogonadal symptoms in men. It improves. The general health questionnaire of overall health improves. The Beck depression questionnaire of mood improves. The Seattle angina questionnaire of severity of angina, its effect on your life, also improves with testosterone and of course not with placebo therapy. Another study of testosterone in men with angina and type 2 diabetes. 87 men with stable angina and type 2 diabetes, they were not selected for low testosterone status. They're men with coronary disease and adult onset diabetes. You do a baseline assessment, a 24-hour EKG, recording the number of episodes of ischemia, supply, demand, mismatch, ST segment depression, and you do lab studies. Then you randomize them to receive oral testosterone therapy for 12 weeks or placebo. There are other medicines are continued. You reevaluate it 12 weeks. Now, on the 24-hour EKG, here is the placebo group. They have 2.2 hours of ST depression at baseline and placebo therapy had no effect. Conversely, with testosterone therapy, there were fewer ischemic episodes on the 24-hour EKG um, in response to therapy. There were fewer episodes of silent or painless ischemia, fewer episodes of symptomatic ischemia. The ischemic burden, the percentage of time that they were ischemic, had supply-demand mismatch fell significantly with testosterone replacement. Lipid panel improved slightly with testosterone. It did not fall with placebo. Insulin sensitivity did not improve placebo. Of course, it improved with testosterone. That's not a surprise. Testosterone in China, it's a paper published in 1993. 62 men with stable effort-induced angina, 60 had a prior heart attack, three were diabetic, six were hypertensive, seven had prostate enlargement, you do the baseline studies and then randomize them to receive oral testosterone undecanoate. The trade name is Andriol. It's used in the Far East and Europe or placebo. And then you repeat the studies at 30 days. And what you find, routine labs, CBC, kidney, liver, chemistry, run change. No effect on the cardiac alcohol findings of pump function. Testosterone does not increase ejection fraction. Side effects were few, no, no increased frequency of side effects with active therapy versus placebo, and there were many non-cardiac health benefits. Improved spirits and physical strength in 83%, better appetite in 40%, improved sexual function in 47%, sleeping better in 8%. Now why you get all these really nice quality of life benefits 
except sleeping better is only 8%. Why weren't they sleeping better? Well, it's pretty simple. They were staying up all night having great sex, so they didn't need to sleep as much. Estradiol and testosterone levels, compared to controls, the estradiol levels were higher, the testosterone levels were lower, the estradiol to testosterone level was greater in the coronary patients versus the controls. In response to therapy, the estradiol to testosterone level falls. EKG findings, the ST segment changes, in China, they, they have a standardized reporting uh, mechanism very effective, effective, total effective, ineffective, and worse. 69% of the men had a significant improvement in their EKG versus 33% with placebo. The Holter findings improved 75% versus 9%. Angina pain, frequency, and severity improved in three-fourths of the men with active therapy. So testosterone is working around the world. To summarize the benefits of testosterone replacement therapy in men with coronary disease, Angina frequency and severity decreases, your nitroglycerin requirement falls, you can walk farther than the treadmill, you have fewer episodes of ischemia during everyday life, energy level improves, sense of well-being improves, depression is, in patients with coronary disease is attenuated. This concludes the first part of our presentation on the first DVD. You can eject this DVD and put in DV number two and we'll continue with the discussion of the benefits of testosterone in men with congestive heart failure.